rates of uh, Canadian prisoners or offenders uh, in our correctional uh, system. Uh, the, um, in our second panel today, we welcome from the Union of Canadian Correctional Officers, Jason Godin, uh, who is the national president. I, I thought you were going to have two other folks with you, but I, you're on your own, uh, sir. And uh, we'll, you, you have an opening statement, I understand, and we will uh, have many questions, as you probably heard from the previous panel. <laughs> welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, just want to thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm going to sort of go over my presentation. I wasn't sure exactly uh, where the committee, uh, what you're looking for, but I'm going to put my, my material on the table from the union, and we'll see. Um, again, I'd like to thank you for inviting us, the Union Canadian Correctional Officers, to speak with you today. I'm also joined by my colleague and National Vice President, uh, Eric Thibault, who's uh, joined me today. He's at the back somewhere. <laughs> I guess I'm here, still here by myself. Uh, our union represents over 7,200 members working in all federal institutions across Canada, including treatment centers. We are first responders behind the walls of institutions when incidents occur, acting sometimes as police officer, paramedic, and firefighters. As our mandate says, we contribute to public safety by actively encouraging and assisting offenders to become law-abiding citizens while exercising reasonable, safe, secure, and humane control. We do this 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and I can assure you that's no easy task. Correctional officers in our country are working under the Corrections and Conditional Release Act, which clearly states that offenders retain the rights of all members of society, except those that are, as a consequence of the sentence, lawfully and necessarily removed or restricted. Among those fundamental human rights, there is the right to security of person. To ensure this right is preserved and to fulfill our mandate, correctional officers need many tools, one of which is the use of administrative segregation. Over the last years, there has been a lot said about this practice, and it's fair to say that there are a lot of misconceptions around the use of segregation in Canada. First, as the words can be misleading, it is important to say that in our view, there is no such thing as solitary confinement in our country. We are not a third world country, and solitary confinement is best left to the Hollywood movie producers. We use administrative segregation to separate an inmate from general population for a multitude of reasons, like preventing inmates on inmate assaults, inmate on staff assaults, self-harming inmates that need direct observation, disciplinary cases, and those inmates that seek protection for numerous reasons. While solitary confinement isolates inmates from any human contact for 22 to 24 hours a day, in administrative segregation, the inmates are in contact with staff regularly, and sometimes even more than when they are in general population. Also, it's important to understand that for correctional officers, segregation is always a last resort solution. Although the reality of our work environment would not allow us to carry out our mandate without this tool, we never use it lightly. During the past decade, the offender population has changed. According to CSC Strategic Plan for Human Resource Management 2007 to 2010, the changing offender pro population presents significant security and reintegration challenges. That trend continues today. In recent years, the offender population has been increasingly characterized by offenders with extensive histories of violence and violent crimes, previous youth and adult convictions, affiliations with gangs and organized crime, serious substance abuse histories and problems, serious mental health disorders, high rates of infection with hepatitis C and HIV. Though the numbers of incidents have not increased significantly, these numbers do not tell the true story in terms of the intensity of violence of the incidents that occurs in the institutions. In the past, inmates would take great care to hide from correctional officers an assault or an attempt to murder a fellow inmate. It is no longer the case. Increasingly, officers report inmates are launching brazen attacks with no effort at all to shield their violence. Those trend lines are clear and continue to demonstrate a more intensive need for security in federal penitentiaries. Effective management of these situations and of this more complex offender population requires greater resources. Increase in specialized services, example, mental health care for offenders, more distinct and targeted interventions and new training and equipment for staff. Also as an essential tool, the use of administrative segregation is paramount in keeping staff and inmates safe inside the walls. As I stated previously, administrative segregation allows correctional officers to manage disruptive inmates, ensuring that the rights of staff are protected and the rights of inmates are respected. Another important matter for us is 
how to manage inmates who suffer from mental illness. This constitutes a growing sector of incarcerated, the incarcerated population in federal institutions. As a union, we do not debate the wisdom or the morality of this shift. Our priorities are the security of the institutions and the safety of inmates and staff. UCOSAC CSN position is to maintain an integrated approach to the management of, of this class of inmate. The union fully supports psych psychological treatment but insists on the need to recognize that the potential for violence and unpredictable behavior remains, as does the resulting need for proper security protocols. In order for effective treatment to take place, the institutional environment must be safe and secure. The primary role of correctional officers in our treatment centers is to provide that safe and secure environment for treatment to take place. We need all correctional officers to be trained on mental health issues, not just a targeted select group. In order to do this, more resourcing is required. In addition to healthcare professionals available at treatment centers and regional hospitals, the union has repeatedly advocated for the government to resource funding for all institutions across Canada to ensure that health care staff are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to deal with inmates with mental health issues who are not housed in treatment centers. In 2014-2015, correctional officers conducted over 2,000 medical interventions with inmates. Many of those interventions were related to mental illness, and although this work is part of our mandate, we don't have all the skills of healthcare professionals. Yet, we are expected to perform this role with limited training. The presence of those, these professionals at all times in the institutions is a necessity to ensure that we're able to carry out our mandate. The other demographic group we want to bring to the attention of the committee today is the high-risk women offenders. It is a constantly growing group as the federally sentenced women incarcerated population has increased by almost 38% over the last 10 years. The high-risk female inmates we are referring to are those violent high-risk, risk to public safety, risk to escape, and to the institution as a whole, and those with serious mental health conditions that elevates them to a higher level of risk to be a danger to themselves, staff, and other inmates. The series of violent confrontations at the Kingston Prison for Women in April 1994 were a catalyst for sweeping changes to the Correctional Service of Canada policies governing the incarceration of federally sentenced women. From this, five women's prisons institutions were built and one female healing lodge with housing units similar to men's minimum security institutions on the basis of community living. In 2002, maximum security units were built in with the compounds which consisted of small segregation range of each three or four cells maximum. The Commission of Inquiry into certain events at the Prison for Women in Kingston led by Madam Justice Louise Arbor issued a number of recommendations that continue to inform the management of the network of institutions for women that was subsequently developed in each of CSC's administrative regions across the country. One of the Commission's key recommendations concerned the use of segregation, that the practice of long-term confinement in administrative segregation be brought to an end. Unfortunately, violent incidents in institutions for women still give rise to prolonged segregation of inmates. Disturbances in segregation areas continue to occur on a regular basis. Accompanied at times by interventions of the Institutional Emergency Response Team, in recent years, correctional officers, other CSC personnel and inmates have been taken hostage, assaulted, injured and threatened with death in a wave of incidents that repeatedly involved a hardcore of female inmates. The small segregation units have a low cell, cell count of three to four, not one larger in our five women's institutions. The segregation ranges are not only being used for administrative segregation, but also as the secure observation ranges for those inmates who require a high, often constant level of mental health monitoring. There is no other observation ranges available in the women's institutions outside the segregation ranges that are located on the maximum security units. Although the management protocol has been dismantled and replaced with what CSC has named Mental Health Monitoring, Commissioner's Directive 843, this is no different to the segregation to a segregation placement outside of the legal documentation presented on their institutional files. When placed at this cell level with direct observation by a correctional officer, they may not be an administrative segregation placement, yet still limited when it comes to cell effects, unsupervised or unescorted movements and interventions. With these cases, our mandate as correctional officers by CSC now is to enter immediately once an inmate becomes violent towards themselves. In doing so usually results in these inmates refocusing their violent, self-injurious actions towards us, the correctional officers. These frequent assaults on staff are some of our highest assaults, acts of violence we encounter or experience often daily with these women inmates. 
The frequency with which these events recur in invalidates the notion that new models of incarceration and new institutions would by themselves re resolve most of the problems that were common in previous penitentiary approaches. The direct impact of these incidents on staff and inmates should not be underestimated. We have no choice but to conclude that a certain percentage of maximum security female inmate population represents an ongoing and an unacceptable threat to the security of units. Presently, the only structural option for some of these inmates is at our regional psychiatric center in the, in the uh, Prairie region. This is a specialized psychiatric unit specific to female inmates with specific needs. Issue here is inmate classifications are not considered. Those of all classifications are housed here while participating in counseling. All movement of these inmates are conducted the same, not always monitoring the risk to us. The staffing level of correctional officers are very low on this unit and it does not compare to women's institutions. To date, the sending institution must have consent from the inmate to be transferred to this treatment unit and this unit does not have the cell capacity to house all our violent mentally ill inmates and is by no means a high security unit available for higher functioning maximum high risk inmates. Even if the correctional model described in the Arbor report remains an attractive goal, punitive discipline persists as a feature of prison life for incarcerated women, simply because no other safe alternatives exist. Offenders sometimes serve long terms of imprisonment and segregation pursuant to what used to be called local but now exists as a mental health monitoring or simply no longer administrative segregation stays as the only safe option. Increasingly, both the high-risk violent inmates, those at high risk at a high risk to public safety as well those who are at a high risk to assault themselves and all others have different needs and require greater supervision and specialized unit structures than do most women inmates in maximum security institutions. These inmates continue to be repeatedly transferred between the five institutions but the receiving institution is usually no better equipped to deal with the high risk inmate. Another institution is thus exposed to a predictable cycle of violence without any consistent interventions, mental health professionals or institutional routines. These multiple transfers prompt us to associate them with an escalation in the violent acts committed by these inmates. The current procedure for handling these cases has a direct impact upon the daily operations of the secure your regular population of maximum security inmates or host. Often these inmates residing on the segregation ranges are being managed on secure movement plans where it takes all three officers designated to this unit to complete any of their daily movement outside cell level. This completely mobilizes the daily operations of the secure unit, thus allowing inmates to avoid our, dyna our dynamic security. Any planned staff intervention with our higher risk inmates, the general secure unit inmates must cease their activities and return to their cell. Terminating their activities in this way and limiting their movements over a long period creates a dissatisfaction and increases the level of tension in the unit. In addition, many of the general max inmates require much heavier supervision due to an antisocial personality or severe mental health disorders. Isolating them from interaction with the personnel can lead to an increase in their level of anxiety. We can then be confronted with aggravated situations with a nonetheless limited capacity to take action. Accordingly, this compromises the security of staff, the inmates, and indeed the entire institution. While segregating high-risk women for very long periods of time does effective pro provide a means for managing the risk they represent, the union is conscious that this practice in, is in no way responds to their considerable needs. The fact that these inmates cannot work and be remunerated entails problems at the other levels within our institutions. In addition to a restrictive milieu, we decrease their autonomy by impoverishing them and preventing them from treating themselves to a miscellaneous canteen, hygiene and clothing items. The mental health inmates who are housed on the segregation unit often have daily physical interventions by us to cease their self-injurious behaviors and more more times than not, they have to be physically placed in soft restraints, the Pinnell bed, in an alternative uh, makeshift room also on the secure unit. This again ceases immediate injury to the inmate. It is, it is a tool for us to stop self-inflicted injuries, rep repeated entries and potential assaults on us, but again this automatically ceases any uh, other operations of this unit and often limits general max populations to cell level movements not even pod or modular movement. However, we cannot turn a blind eye to 
at women who make regular use of violence and those who are sentenced to complete federal time in our institutions. We must instead work to find an appropriate response to this phenomenon, a response that will preserve staff and inmates' rights to a secure and safe environment, and have their medical professionals working on, with the correctional officers 24 hours a day. In 2005, the union submitted a report recommending CSC create an appropriate infrastructure for high-risk female inmates, both those of high risk to public safety and those who pose the violent risk to themselves and others with severe mental health diagnosis. This proposed unit would enable them to receive programming and treatment and to engage in daily activities and movement routines. More than 10 years later, we are still waiting for a real discussion around our recommendation. Thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions. Merci. Thank you, uh, Mr. Godin. Uh, we certainly have a, a list, and we'll begin with the Deputy Chair, okay. Senator Toulajan. Um, thank you. Followed thank by you. Senator Hubley. Sorry. Thank you for your presentation this morning. The one issue that you uh, didn't discuss, and I, I would like uh, you to um, talk about or maybe elaborate a bit, is that the, the article that was in the Globe and Mail um, last year of July, which said that the PTSD affects 36 percent of the male prison uh, officers, and you were quoted in that, that there's no help uh, available um, to you, whereas to other pro uh, professions, whether it's army officers or police officers, they do have that help available. Has anything changed since then? Well, there's a couple things that have actually changed. Um, we're, we're, we participated in an Occupational Stress Injuries Committee under the Public Safety Committee, where we uh, there's 15 recommendations now on the table uh, for the government. We haven't seen any drastic changes at this point, but of course they're only recommendations. Some of those recommendations are uh, establishing a national treatment center for public safety officers at the national level to help them with uh, occupational stress injuries. Um, there's, there's also a recommendation in there where the federal government is suggesting to the provincial jurisdictions that they adopt a presumptive legislation around PTSD treatment. Uh, Ontario is the first, uh, the first province in the country to recognize correctional officers uh, under that category, a presumption for first responders, and the federal government has called upon that. We continue to try to work, uh, we're working with our commissioner right now around the R2MR program, the Road to Mental Readiness, so all of our correctional officers are now receiving that training, which is a, which is a good step, but a lot more needs to be done. Uh, we'll be very curious to see uh, whether this government uh, uh, takes uh, seriously the recommendations on the table and adopts some of those uh, those treatment programs. Um, but there's a lot more to be done and uh, we also continue to strive to uh, to improve upon our EAP uh, programs as well, uh, which uh, you know sorely lacks the resources that we require uh, to make sure that our, our officers are getting uh, getting the treatment they need. So, so if, if an officer um, needs help, who, who would they turn to? Would they be turning to their own Healthcare, um, you know, like their own doctors, or is is there someone on site, or is there other help available? Well, we have an employees can can phone uh, for assistance, and they get referrals to to counselors. Um, in fact, uh, but one of our problems, I'll give you an example. We had a, a riot at Saskatchewan Penitentiary in uh, December, uh, where many officers uh, it was quite traumatic. There was a, there was an inmate death uh, while that occurred, and we had some problem getting some counselors uh, to assist officers uh, before the Christmas period uh, because some of our services, our EAP services, have been moved uh, to to Health Canada, and so Sometimes Health Canada just doesn't have the resources or, or the uh, the ability to provide all those services that we need. Um, so we, we sometimes run into those situations. Uh, in terms of a, a WSIB claim for for uh, for post-traumatic stress or an occupational stress injury, it's, it's from what we've seen, and it's kind of early to tell, but it's going fairly well in Ontario because they've adopted the presumptive legislation. So what's happened in Ontario is when someone is diagnosed with an occupational stress injury, there's a presumption there and they, you know, remove Moving forward, and we're also looking at best practices and some options on where we can treat some of these officers. In fact, we're working with Corrections Canada as well to see about the available uh, clinical options that are available to help correctional officers. But there's a lot of work to be done, and uh, we're counting on the government uh, as one of their mandates to step up to the plate uh, around uh, mental health of its employees. Um, so we're we're waiting to see what they do with the 15 recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hubley. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for your presentation, your presentation Mr. Godin. Uh, in December the 1st, 2016, uh, Howard Sapers uh, testified before the House of Commons uh, Public Safety Committee. Um, there was a couple of things that 
that are of interest that I'm wondering you would comment on. Uh, specifically, the use of pepper spray on inmates had tripled since 2011. And he, um, he noted that the use of agents such as pepper spray had uh, replaced less coercive means of conflict intervention. I'm wondering if you might comment on that. And also, later he noted outstanding recommendations from the inquest into the death of Ashley Smith, including the need for CSC to enhance human rights and correctional law training among frontline correctional staff. So I'm wondering if you've seen any advancement on those recommendations. Conditions. Well, I, I think it's I think it's noteworthy. I mean, I, I first want to make the statement that uh, use of force for correctional officers, 80% of our use of force incidents are spontaneous. So they're often very, very unpredictable. Even Mr. Zinger testified earlier today that our use of force is down uh, a little bit. Um, and that's, that's obviously an encouraging sign because we don't want inmates or staff hurt. Um, can more be done? Well, of course. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're always uh, seeking more training uh, on all fronts. Um, certainly, we have dynamic security training. Uh, that occurs, uh, you know, once once a correctional officer joins the service and, and while inside. Um, certainly, we could add uh, more more techniques around de-escalation training. Uh, there certainly can be more done in those areas. Um, many of the recommendations from the Smith Inquiry, um, quite frankly, the union agreed with a lot of those recommendations. And and uh, I think if if you recall some of the press uh, that went out, in fact, um, some of the comments I made were that the jury got it right on a lot of uh, aspects of it. A lot of the practices. Were already in place. I think one of the key uh, key uh, concerns for us was around uh, making sure that 24-hour health care was available um, uh, at those facilities and certainly at all the facilities across Canada. And that was one of the recommendations that we uh, we had uh, had agreed upon. So um, there's a lot that can be done. Um, use of force, unfortunately, is is a reality of our business. And um, you know, I've been in the service a long time. Um, I've been a correctional officer on the floor for 14 years, and it's not anywhere that anybody wants to go. It's always a last resort. But unfortunately, with the unpredictable human behavior that we're dealing with, um, sometimes it, it, that's the way it goes. And uh, it is encouraging to hear that the use of force is down a little bit. Um, and that's, that's a good news story for correctional officers and, and everybody working inside institutions. Were any of the, are there any of the recommendations that, uh, that evolved from the Ashley Smith incident um, that you you find should be uh, should be uh, there should be some movement on it that isn't uh, being done. Are there any of the recommendations you would like to see? Well, I think you know. I mean, there's there's some recommendations, like I said, I think that for the most part have been implemented. I mean, there's quite a few recommendations that have been implemented. The biggest issue with the Ashley Smith case uh, for us is the fact that if if we're going to have these women in custody, we want a facility to manage them. That's, you know, and there's infrastructure issues, and, and I understand there's community uh, hospital settings, there's, I believe there's Brockville, there's Pinnell, and, you know, but at the same time, I mean, if you take a look at the Brockville situation, there was a situation that occurred there with a female offender, I think it was last year, where, you know, staff got hurt, and they just didn't have the infrastructure to, to manage uh, that. So the other issue that we, we also have around uh, around uh, our, our treatment centers is that we don't have uh, the option to use chemical restraints. Um, this is something that is that is used uh, in, in the provincial uh, hospitals and this is something that we don't have access to. So for us, um, you know, we we say, look, it's it's either give us a facility to manage them in, in uh, conjunction with the healthcare staff or put them in a facility where they can be managed, where, where people don't get hurt. And we're often caught in this, correctional officers are caught in this dilemma of, well, you know, the, the provincial hospitals won't accept them. Uh, that's a big problem. And sometimes if there's a security incident, they're sent back to us. So, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we can't really win as correctional officers. And, and a lot of times, the, these, diff, these most difficult case, cases put a tremendous strain on correctional officers. They put a strain on the resourcing of, of the institutions. You know, there's not a multitude of these offenders. There's a handful of them, but at the same time, um, we can't sort of be half and half. We can't say, okay, look, you know, we've sent the person to the too dangerous, or there's security risk for us, and we're sending them back. So at some point, that's why the union has been calling, and you know, I won't call it a special handling unit. I'll call it a unit, a unit where we can work with the healthcare professionals to manage these most 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 difficult cases. Okay. Thank you, Senator Hubley, uh, Senator Martin, followed by Senator Pate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you very much for uh, being here. And um, just I want to say that 
as a former educator, some of my students have gone into your um, profession, and I think it's a, a real calling to be able to do what you do, the challenges that are faced, as in, as with other professions. And I know with the, the passion with which some of my students talk about the work and the challenges that you're being met with. So I really appreciate the work that you're doing to, and doing the best work you can to uh, address um, what is happening in our, in our correctional system. So I have two questions, one in regards to the diversity of the, um, the population uh, in our system and that language barriers and cultural barriers um, sometimes will unnecessarily escalate a situation because they are there. Would you talk a bit about how you're addressing some of those barriers and whether you're seeing more diversity in the you know, in, in your profession and is that something you're working towards to address the growing uh, diverse population? We, we currently have cultural diversity training, I think, which is which is essential. And um, we also have um, many ethnic minorities working as correctional officers, and this is a good thing. Um, the, the cultural awareness tra training uh, occurs on the, right from the, the get-go, from the time that a correctional officer enters, uh, enters uh, Corrections Canada. So I think there's some steps certainly being taken, um, um, you know, for that cultural awareness. It is important to correctional officers. We, you know, we work 24 hours a day with offenders, and we need to know... Um, we need to be aware of those situations and the more training we get or the more better understanding of those those cultural uh, differences is is important for us to do our job on the floor. We have a lot of um, um, indigenous uh, correctional officers that work in our healing lodges and and more predominantly in in the uh, in the um, the western provinces uh, where the, we have a high Aboriginal uh, populations. Um, and uh, you know I we you know I talk to a lot of those officers and uh, they always give me lessons on on you know well what you know this and that and I learn quite a bit from them because quite frankly I've never had the training. So, you know, so there, there's some steps being taken um, for sure um, in terms of um, communicating with inmates. If we need to do that, we have the resources available. We'll we'll go to Corrections Canada. Uh, we'll you know we'll we'll say, look, sometimes we have officers that are that are bilingual or they may speak uh, different languages uh, that may be that may be uh, helpful. Although translation is not a part of our job description technically um, for the most part it usually we make it work one way or the other and uh, I think there are those uh, those uh, communication uh, issues being dealt with with the service so yes thank you for that question so uh, I just want to pick up I want to make sure I heard you correctly you were saying uh, mr. Godin that uh, You've talked with a number of indigenous correctional officers, and they train you in essence on the job. But and, and you find that helpful because you've never had the training. But you also said that that cultural sensitivity training is mandatory. Yeah. Well, you sorry. I just it. maybe I'll make, make myself clear. Unfortunately, I, I haven't had that initial training because this is something that's been that's been uh, come out, come online a few years ago. But I am aware that it is a training program when correctional officers enter uh, uh, to become correctional officers. They go to they go to the training facility in Regina, and this is part of their initial recruitment training um, uh, to have that kind of training. And and again. Um, uh, I'm just sort of speaking out of the box that, you know, I, I learn a lot when I'm talking to other correctional officers because for me, I just haven't had it. I haven't been able to uh, to get and have that kind of training. So so just to follow up, so, so it's mandatory for new officers. Correct, yeah. And so what happens on an ongoing basis? So an officer who's there for 10, 20, 30 years. Yeah. Is there ongoing training? I'm not aware of any ongoing uh, cultural diversity training um, for correctional officers that have been in the service for a number of years. All I'm aware of is that, that it exists on the front end when you enter uh, at an entry level as a correctional officer. So I'm not aware of any any uh, refresher training that goes along down the line. So uh, Should it happen? Um, uh, you know, to be honest with you, uh, you know, the more training we have, the better it is. Um, I think that in any profession, you're going to hear that, whether it's from correctional officers or, or doctors or lawyers, whoever, the more training we have on, on whatever it may be, um, the better off uh, we're suited. So um, you won't get any argument from the union uh, at all whatsoever on, on any types of training, including cultural uh, diversity training at, at any level of your career, that's for sure. Senator Toulouson has a supplementary as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Martin. Um, you sp speak of having um, officers from different cultural backgrounds. Have you ever had an in, um, instance where 
you didn't have like different people speak different languages so have you ha is there help av available to you if you don't understand what an offender is saying or a prisoner is saying and you don't have anyone from that ethnic background is who do you turn to in those circumstances well one of the things that correctional officers would normally do and i, I can't tell you I've, well i've maybe personally encountered it once um uh, at kingston penitentiary many years ago but when we went to the management to ask them uh, for assistance they were able to manage those particular cases um so in my experience i was only in, really involved in one case but um it worked out well and this individual spoke portuguese as an example and we were able to to converse in fact we had two uh to officers uh, working that day who were Portuguese. So, um, but if we don't have those people available to us, it's our responsibility if we can't communicate with an inmate to go to management and say, look, you know, here's the situation, or this person's coming in, and, and we would go to management and seek their assistance. I don't, I'm not aware of this being a huge issue, to be quite honest with you. I think maybe that's what you're getting at. I, I don't hear about this often. Obviously, we have our, our francophone inmates um, that, uh, from what I'm aware in, in the country, are if they want to use French as their first language, uh, this, it's not a difficulty uh, from my understanding, but it's not a problem that I hear a lot of, to be quite honest with you. Senator Mark? My second question was regarding uh, one of your final comments in your testimony about the appropriate infrastructure for high-risk female inmates. Seems to me after 10 years, if this is a, a critical recommendation that would really uh, support the system, prevent you know, the high-risk uh, uh, inmates from injuring, like hurting themselves and others and, and really sort of uh, address that great, that growing challenge in, in the facilities. Um, you say it's been 10 years, but who has, have you been at the table with um, officials and the new government? Is this something on their ra radar? And could you actually expand a little bit about what you're referring to? Um, well, I mean, we, we've been very public about our position around infrastructure for high-risk offenders. Um, we have a high-risk um, male offender unit uh, known as the Special Handling Unit in Quebec. Um, the union is, you know, and infrastructure-wise, it's, it's there to, to manage the most difficult cases. Um, and when I'm talking about infrastructure, what happens sometimes is we're dealing with, um, you know, and I'll give you an example, you know, oftentimes we're asked to look through a food slot, you know, to observe an inmate who, who may be suffering from a mental illness. And if you want to talk about infrastructure, there's a perfectly good example um, of, you know, why we, why we have concerns with that. Um, maybe I'll give you an example. I, I, I toured a, um, a, a treatment center in the United States uh, this summer, and, and I, I went into their psychiatric unit, and it was, what was quite interesting was, not only did they have 24-hour-a-day health care available to them, unlike uh, our system where it's only available in the treatment centers and the regional hospitals, but in that particular unit, uh, they had a, a, um, a full glass um, wall um, where the officer, in conjunction with the health care professionals, could sit and, and observe very, very clearly any self-injurious behavior. So when I speak of infrastructure for, for those types of cases, that's sort of what I'm speaking about. Um, and... I know that I, you know, from personal experience, correctional officers, it's you. You can't imagine how difficult it is, um, you know, trying to observe inmates through cell windows uh, and through through food slots. And um, you know, I've I've known officers to be laying on the floor talking to inmates for hours on end uh, while no healthcare professionals are there, uh, trying to make sure that 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 individual doesn't harm themselves. And uh, it's uh, it's an infrastructure issue for us, and uh, and like I said, we don't want to interrupt the other programming of the other inmates, and sometimes that's what's happening. And so, if you're dealing with one of these high risk women offenders, you're and I'm not just saying women, but males as well, you you end up interrupting the programs and all the other routines for the inmates, and. This creates a tension, as I said in my opening comments in the unit. So we're, we're just wanting to make sure that when we have those very distinct high-risk cases, that we have the proper type of infrastructure uh, uh, to use. The other interesting thing about the, this uh, treatment facility was the use of chemical restraints. Uh, this was in a, a federal institutional setting uh, in, uh, in uh, Maryland, and uh, they had a lot of things, uh, some, some more tools available to them that, that we might not have uh, in, uh, and it's not about, 
I think I want to, you know, we want to be really clear. It's not about mortar and bricks. Um, I think that we have to realize that's not what this conversation is about. And we'll engage anybody who's willing to sit down with us to have a real conversation around what we need to manage. It. And, you know, we're more than willing to work with the healthcare professionals and do what needs to be done. But let's make sure it's done safely and make, make sure we have the infrastructure that's required. Um, if you take a look at Brockville, there was an issue there where a nurse was stabbed in the neck. Well, they clearly didn't have the inf infrastructure uh, to manage that particularly high-risk case. So. so, Mr. Chair, is that something we could request? Yes. Something in writing regarding the infrastructure needs mm -hmm. that you would recommend that would really greatly improve the system because that would be useful for our report. We'd be more than willing We'd to provide you uh, what we're looking for, for sure, Thank yes. You. Appreciate that very much. Uh, Senator P. Thank you. Nice to see you again, Mr. Godin. We've known each other for a long time. And um, while you've never worked in the prisons for women, I certainly have worked with many, many of your members and, um, and as you know, have a great deal of respect for the incredible work that gets done on the ground and um, the challenges that are faced. And as you probably also know, um, increasingly, uh, the frustration of not being able to address some of these issues, individuals have come to, a, um, in my previous position, would come to me confidentially and, and raise some of these issues. I wanted to um, talk a bit about um, the, 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 the um, issues that you were just talking about with Senator Martin, because I know the actual the recommendation that you're talking about does go back actually not just 10 years, but 20 years and um, led to, at one point, the identification of the management protocol, which you talked about, um, that was developed by the union first and then adopted by the Correctional Service of Canada, but was ultimately terminated because it was found to actually have been escalating violence and to be problematic and also unlawful in, in the end in terms of the way it was being used. And in fact, the manner in which women, most of whom were Indigenous women, were held and one um, black woman as and one non-indigenous woman, non-racialized woman, um, the manner in which they were held actually um, ended up being an escalation. But also when we visited the special handling unit for men that you spoke about where there were 57 men at the time and seven women on the protocol, in fact, the measures being used were even more secure and more limiting um, than what was existing in the special handling unit. And so I'm, I'm curious as to, uh, I'm going to ask a question first, but there's one more comment. When, um, before, I'm really glad to hear your comments about the Ashley Smith recommendations, because before um, the inquest, the report that was put out by the union about Ashley Smith described her as um, constantly assaulting um, staff, as being constantly violent, and um, and yet when the examination at the inquest happened, staff member after staff member appeared and talked about how they liked her, they got along with her, um, and the images that became, it became very clear that most of them had first had an image of her as constantly assaultive from reports, not from actual experience with her. And that while she did often resist when they were trying to cut ligatures off, that was after she had been in a situation where um, many of them described her as her situation incredibly desperate. And so it, it, um, two observations that I have is over the years that you and I have both been doing this, um, increasingly there are more spontaneous uses of force, less use of dynamic security. And in just in the last few years, I've been in prisons where they've started to pepper spray even as I'm offering to intervene in a situation. And, um, and the staff themselves have commented that the ability to call in other people who they know might assist in de-escalating has been more and more limited. And so um, given that part of your mandate as, a, as officers is to, to try and diminish the uses of force, to try and diminish um, those kinds of violent interventions, um, and to assist in the reintegration, I'm curious as to what you would recommend in terms of seeing a way to breathe life into those provisions so that officers like you when you were in those positions and your colleagues um, can actually fulfill that mandate they have of assisting in the safe reintegration of individuals into the community ultimately because that's the mm -hmm. mission and the, the mandate you have. And, um, and also if you can comment on um, the satisfaction survey that was done around staff that showed that the majority of staff felt that in fact um, 
if they came forward with information and raised concerns, and it happened, we heard it again in the Ashley, their colleagues or their supervisors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we know about the situation of staff being told not to intervene with Ashley, right. for instance, and, and people being fearful of that. So any comments you can have on that sure. and how that process could be assisted so that the very good work that staff do on the ground um, can be encouraged and, and can be supported. Yeah. I, I think that um, one of the things that's very clear is dynamic security varies by level of institution, and I think that you've been around the system long enough to know that as well. Um, certainly by the, the, the security sometimes dictates. I think they're really, uh, and by the way, I have worked with female offenders uh, in my previous life uh, in the provincial system, so I have a little bit of familiarity with that, but not in our, our current system. But the dynamic security piece uh, for, for us, Senator, to be honest with you, is, is uh, very frustrating. Um, because, like I mentioned earlier, more training is always the best that we can we can do, and we continue to do that. But unfortunately, correctional officers never get recognized for the thousands of interventions, verbal interventions that they're doing every day. And this is this is extremely frustrating. Although we 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 watch a videotape where it doesn't, you know. The outcome looks like, oh my God, it's very horrific to the public. And nobody realizes that there's already been about 20 to 30, maybe an hour of conversation before it gets to that point. And one of the, one of the things that I hear from my members, and I often hear in, in, in incidents, um, and I've seen everything from you know, having to use lethal force to, to, you know, use of force. And often when you talk to the officers, they'll say, you know what, Jason, we tried everything. We tried to talk the person down. We tried to, we, we, we made every effort we possibly could. So, you know, to, to answer your, your question, um, I, think it's, I think it's really to focus more around the, the more training we get. When it comes to dynamic security, as, as we're getting ready to, to release offenders back into the community, obviously the level of dynamic security at a minimum security unit or a minimum security institution is oftentimes quite a bit different uh, than it might be in a maximum security institution. Um, and, and uh, you know, often our correctional officers are de doing re-socialization escorts into the community and assisting with, with work programs and, and those kinds of things. And that's a good news story because you have to realize that correctional officers uh, live in the very same community that these people are going to be released in. So correctional officers do care about that. They care about dynamic security. They care about the second part of their rehabilitative mandate. But as you know, our, our first priority as correctional officers is the public safety and security of Canadians. And that's that's number one mandate. And, and at the same time, part of our mandate is the successful reintegration of offenders. And we do that by encouraging and assisting through the mission statement and also through dynamic security. Um, you know, the, the spontaneous use of force, as you heard in earlier testimony, is down. Um, and that's a good sign. Uh, and again, uh, the more training that we have, to be quite honest with you, uh, the better it is. Maybe the answer to your second question about fear of reprisal. Um, I, you know, we were very clear in, in the Smith inquiry about about our members being under tremendous amount of duress. And, and I know that you're very familiar with the report that we released uh, around the fact that our members were fearful of their jobs at the time. Uh, they were be being given orders, uh, um, you know, to to not intervene. And uh, you can imagine that the the stress and the emotional uh, burden that put on some of those members and. I know those members very, very well that were involved in that case and some of the conversations I've had with them, the emotional stress and toll that it took on them um, because, you know, they were being told, well, look, you didn't do this right and you didn't do that right. And, you know, even though some of those correctional officers had impeccable records, you know, they had impeccable records as correctional officers on the floor. They were, they were trainers, they were actively involved, they were, and yet at the same time they were being told, well, you're doing this wrong and if you refuse this order, um, you know, and that was one of our, our recommendations that, that we agreed with in the Smith uh, recommendations was simply, look, we, we can't fear reprisal uh, from our employer if we come forward and say, look, we don't agree with this, this order. And that's just one example. I mean, I think, you know, as correctional officers, we should, and we do oftentimes, we'll, we'll go to the administration and say, you know what? We don't agree with the approach we're taking. We don't agree with this policy. We don't necessarily agree with their routine. And it could be for many reasons uh, as to why. So the more training we have, I think that's, that's good. And uh, certainly, um, you know, we want to make sure that we have no fear of, of uh, reprisal from the employer. And we made that very clear in the, in the Smith uh, situation. So. Um, you mentioned, and as you, you know, we might have differing views on this whole issue of how many women actually are high risk or violent. Any documentation you have around that would be useful as well, because I think there's, you know, there's two very different pictures emerging, and in particular. Uh, 
um, it, where those individuals have actually uh, been predominantly individuals with mental health issues who are resisting situations where they're in restraints or um, and so their responses are to those because um, every bit of information that we have is that in fact most of those incidents are are not if you compare for instance an incident in a prison for men versus women doesn't even compare in terms of risk and and um, public safety issues so and maybe, like I said, there's there's few cases in the system. Um, and, you know, again, I mentioned those few cases. If we could manage them in an area where it doesn't disrupt everybody else. And that's what our, our goal has been. And I, I wouldn't pretend to, to say that, you know, the numbers are the same, obviously, on the male side versus versus the female side. And, and uh, at the same time, we're, we're just looking for more options. And as you know... Um, it, for us, it's that fine line of a diagnosis of a mental illness versus behavioral problems. And, and I, I think, you know, you're certainly familiar with that um, situation where, you know, sometimes we have behavioral, you know, inmates with behavioral problems um, or disciplinary problems or, you know, they're doing contraband or they're, you know, involved in gang activity or whatever, but then we also have the mental health side of it. And, and as a correctional officer, we're always walking that fine line. And we're not necessarily the experts um, to determine that either. I mean, we're, you know, we, we see a behavioral problem and, you know, obviously a behavioral problem, we can't let that affect all the other inmates in the institution. So that's part of part of the issue. So. So would, sure. Um, just would a Section 29 type of an option where a mental health unit is available for individuals to, who are um, predominantly have mental health issues, whether it's Ashley Smith or others, um, that kind of recommendation, would that be something the union would see as a positive thing? Well, I, again, I, I, and I think it would be a positive thing, but, it, but you, you have to realize, again, we're always caught, uh, Senator, uh, between the two-way. I mean, we, you know, you, you know uh, in certain situations with the high-risk uh, female offenders, uh, on more than one occasion, our members have been saying, look, this person needs to go to a treatment facility outside the institution, and we've tried desperately, and you know that, we've tried desperately to do that. Um, so for us, if we're going to manage these offenders inside the federal uh, population, then give us the tools we need to manage, and if we're not not going to give us all the tools, then I guess the organization or CSC has to look at alternatives. I mean, we're not completely opposed to that, um, but I, but, but as I said before, there's things that we could also do in our own system to manage those high-risk cases, uh, infrastructure issues, um, those types of things. But again, that's not a decision for for us, to, our union, to make. We can only say, look, it's either one or the other, um, and and um, we can't be. Um, you know, half and half. Eh? You know, we, we send someone somewhere and then, oh, well, no, this is not working out for us. And, and all of a sudden they send them back to us and we're right back to square one. And, and I know of a particular case that that's exactly what the members said to me. You know, hey, look, they were there, couldn't manage, now they're back and they're doing the same old behaviors that they were doing before. So what it leads to for, for correctional officers is burnout. Uh, they get tired. It's just a constant every day, every day. They're having to manage that particular high-risk case, and then they're having to manage the other offenders in the unit. So, again, we're not necessarily stuck on one or the other, um, although we've maintained a position about a, a special unit, but we just want a solution. I think that's the most important thing. So, okay. Thank you. We have a few minutes left, and I just have one question, actually, to follow, out, follow up on your, your terminology, burnout. Uh, we have a lot of statistics in front of us in the past uh, two days of hearings that we've had, and we have a long way to go, and you use the term, we never get recognized for the thousands of interventions we make, and then you use the term right now about burnout. Uh, the statistics we have in terms of mental health, we have those numbers, and Indigenous and Black uh, men and, uh, and women. Where does a correctional officer go who is suffering from mental stress, and at what point is there an empathetic management and a system and a protocol that happens and do you have any numbers that would indicate just how difficult it can be in a position that you have worked in? I, I think the most telling numbers are the statistics around PTSD and occupational stress injuries. If you look consistently, um, certainly over the last couple of years, the occupational stress injuries amongst correctional officers are higher than any other uh, first responder public occupation in the country. Our Associate Deputy Minister of Public Safety testified in the occupational stress injuries report that 36% of uh, male correctional officers were suffering from an occupational stress injury or PTSD. So. Um, 
like I mentioned to your colleague earlier about there needs there a lot more needs to be done because I think what happens and I don't mean to I'm I'm not disrespecting my colleagues the paramedics and the firefighters and the police officers but inside the walls of an institution we're all three of those occupations and I don't know whether that's an explanation as to why the rates are higher but Correctional officers are often, you know, one minute we're, we're having to uphold the law because someone has contraband and then five minutes later we're responding to a situation where someone's seriously injured, injured and we have to apply first aid. And then we don't have any health care staff available to us after certain hours. So um, I think that it's, 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 it's very important that the government take a serious look about how we can treat um, these cases as quickly as possible. Correctional officers and many of them who I know who suffer from occupational stress injuries, all they want to do is get back to work. They want to get better and they want to come back to work and they take a lot of pride in their job and sometimes they can't come back to work. So, you know, there's, e there's a lot of things occurring. There's a lot of discussion around mental health of employees as well as inmates in the system. Um, but at the same time, we, we need to see some, some action items uh, by this government around the 15 recommendations from the Public Safety uh, Committee that, that studied occupational stress injuries and heard testimony from various uh, first responders. Unless the senator has a uh, follow-up, we get a couple of minutes here to go. I didn't realize that you've been by yourself here for 45 minutes, but... Uh, Pate promised to go easy on me, so I accepted, uh, I accepted to be by myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, I asked the question of uh, uh, Mr... Was it Mr. Zing? Zinger. Yeah, Zinger. Mr. Zinger, um, we're going to be on the road soon, and we have... There's four or five issues out there, and you've been inside the system... Is there a critical area or place that we should be going, a, a physical place and a critical area of uh, subject matter that we should be focusing in on? The, the study is going to take some time. Mm -hmm. but we're, we want to have updates and or observations because we do know that the government is looking at uh, changing some of the legislation and that may catch up with this study. But we want to, we want to be ahead of the curve, so to speak. Well, I, I, I would strongly suggest, obviously, you, you talk to as many uh, professionals inside, uh, including correctional officers, uh, certainly at the women's facilities, in particular RPC, uh, you know, one of those, uh, the regional psychiatric centre in, in the prairies, to see exactly what, what is occurring there. Um, the more information uh, and the more discussions you can have with all of the staff inside, um, not just correctional officers, but healthcare professionals, and what should we be doing and what, what we shouldn't be doing, I strongly encourage you to, to look at the women's facilities for sure. Um, for for us, um, you know, one of the one of the important elements is is to understand the the workings of administrative segregation and why we utilize segregation. One of the things that correctional officers are extremely fearful of uh, in in uh, in the system is a knee jerk reaction uh, to segregation policies, um, where they just automatically cap um, the number of days, and we're very concerned by that because uh, uh, even in my discussions with uh, with Mr. Zinger, uh, they're not necessarily in favor of that either and we have to recognize that in some cases where they've restricted the use of administrative segregation the number of incidents have actually risen um, and, and uh, again I, I experienced that a little bit this summer in, in talking to New York, New York State and I've been talking to my provincial colleague in uh, in the in the province of Ontario, so take a serious look at at, at, at segregation and why we're using it and what the impacts are. Um, if if there's a restrictive policy there that that ties our hands because that administrative seg piece is a tool for correctional officers, it helps us manage the population. It helps us complete our our mission. Uh, we want to make sure that disruptive inmates are not disrupting all of the other uh, inmates inside the facility, and that's very important. So I strongly try to see as much as you can. Uh, it's a big system. And uh, the more the more you see, the better it is. Senator Pate, and then we'll. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so one of the recommendations of the Ashley Smith inquest was to get rid of segregation, and in the meantime, until such time, to actually limit according to the UN standards. So. Actually, one of the recommendations of the jury was to actually eliminate segregation. And as you know, there have been times in the Correctional Service of Canada where there have been prisons that have not had, for all kinds of reasons, retrofitting or movement closing, um, that we have not had segregation units. And in those times, we've actually seen more dynamic security and more positive interventions. So um, I, you know, I would urge you to look again at this, and it's part of the reason the Canadian Human Rights Commission the Ontario Human Rights Commission 
Howard Saper has recently said that at least for women and those with mental health issues and young people, we should be starting to eliminate the use of segregation. And in fact, other jurisdictions are looking at that as, as that as well. So I, you know, would be happy to continue that conversation. But I think given that you decided to end there, I think it's important that we remind um, the committee and that others know that, in fact, all of the all of the reports that are being done most recently are calling for ends to the, to the uses of segregation, particularly for certain groups. And the, the UN now considers it torture at 15 days. And our government our, and some of our courts have started to look at it as cruel and unusual punishment for under, uh, for any period up to that period as well. Yeah, for us, uh, the abolishment of SEG is not an option. I think, you know, we've, we've been, you know, clearly positioned ourselves uh, as to why that is, um, you know, and, and the limitation of segregation. Uh, sometimes we don't have an option. We don't have a choice. We can't, you know, we've had cases where inmates have been in, uh, you know, uh, segregation and, and uh, um, may, in some cases long term, and then, you know, all of a sudden they're released back out into a population unit and they stab an inmate. So this is what we have to be cognizant of. Um, again, administrative segregation for us is, is not a is not a uh, it's a population management tool it's a tool that we use to to try to make sure that everybody is safe inside including the inmate themselves so certainly uh, that's not one of the recommendations we're in agreement with we had agreed with some of the recommendations Well, again, it's you know, like we said, it's a last resort. Um, that's that's encouraging that the the numbers are down, but at the same time, the pushback that that we get from our members is, you know what, Jason, some of these guys don't don't belong back into the population because they are disrupting and creating other problems again. And we have to be very careful. I would ask that, you know, certainly the government and the committee, you know, you know, you have to realize that in in some cases where segregation has been, um, you know, uh, emptied out. Um, um, let's make sure that we're cognizant and aware if there's a rise in incidents because that's what we, that's what certainly we're seeing in other jurisdictions um, and that's not to say that there's obviously good moves where we're putting inmates back into population and that's 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 for sure and certainly the mental health piece is another piece but those disciplinary and severe behavioral problems when you start releasing those back into a general population that creates a ripple effect on the rest of the population and that's why uh, that's why we, we maintain our position around administrative seg. So if you could provide details of those, because I'm not aware of those kinds of incidents in the women's, so if you can provide details to the committee, I think Excellent. it would be useful. Yes, and thank you, Mr. Godin, uh, for uh, being here today. It's uh, been very helpful for us all, and uh, and we want to uh, tell you, and we all, I say this because we mean it, We uh, and it was said before by Senator Martin, you have a tough job, um, and we appreciate what you do uh, it's uh, you've added a lot of information to it to our thought process in this in this work, and we just want to thank you as well for what you do. My pleasure. That, Thanks to the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair.